Hello and welcome to this special budget, 20, uh, spring budget 2024 episode of Tax Snacks from Old Square Tax Chambers. I am here with Philip Simpson, Casey, Ben Simmons and Shane O'Driscoll and we are all from Old Square Tax Chambers and as, as I think I've trailed adequately, we're going to talk about the spring budget which was announced, released etc today. Philip. Uh, thanks, uh, Hannett. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Um, this feels a bit like a uh, University Challenge episode as we're all arrayed on the screen. Um, <laughs> welcome to Old Square Tax Chambers uh, Tax Snacks uh, episode, special Tax Snacks episode for the spring uh, budget 2024. Um, obviously, a very political budget. Um, the Chancellor uh, stealing one of the more important uh, parts of, of the budget, the abolition of the non-DOM rules, uh, straight out of uh, Labour's uh, policy portfolio, um, uh, with a view, of course, and more generally with the reduction in uh, national insurance contributions by 2% for employed individuals and 3% for self-employed individuals, um, and the abolition of Class 2 NICs, uh, with a view to uh, uh, a forthcoming general election within the next uh, in a, in a, certainly 12 months. Um, what we're going to do um, uh, now is uh, have a reasonably quick um, look through uh, the various uh, changes that are proposed to the tax system uh, in the budget. Uh, I think there's more or less no draft legislation yet and any of the more important stuff, for example, non-DOMs. Um, uh, we're going to start with some indirect taxes, then look at property taxes, uh, corporate taxes, and finally some personal taxes um, uh, uh, as we go through. Um, so first, uh, uh, indirect taxes. Uh, if I could pass over to uh, Ben Simons uh, for uh, the first uh, um, points on those. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, uh, thanks, Philip. Uh, in short, duty freezes have been continued on fuel and alcohol. Um, yeah, so that is good news for, for pub drinkers. Um, tobacco duty has been increased, and um, there will be excise duty on vaping products. Um, so that covers the uh, the indirect tax changes and excise changes to fuel, alcohol and tobacco. And so those are clearly, are, I mean, are they? I suppose it's not really, not, re not really tax relevant, but are those going to be vote win winners, do we think? Well, um, I, I, I look. I think pub drinkers will be pleased by that. Um, <laughs> how much it, you know, how much this will sway people's votes in the, in the next general election. I, yeah, I, I, I think the election election will probably be decided on other issues. But um, you know, it will cheer the hearts of you know of. The alcohol. Uh, yeah. It will. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, yeah. I mean, it will cheer the hearts of people who enjoy a drink at the pub. Um. So, yeah, yeah. Broadly positive. <laughs> and so I think um, one of the more interesting points of this, um, Shane, is the increase in the VAT threshold. Yeah, so the, there's been a slight increase in the threshold um, uh, before somebody has to register for VAT. So it's increasing from 85,000 to 90,000. Um, I think it was pitched as that will uh, is potentially pro, pro business or pro small business. Um, that will allow businesses to have slightly higher th turnover without the necessity or the complexity of having to register for that. Um, mm -hmm. And then also the uh, the taxable threshold um, before a person can apply to deregister is also increased um, uh, by 5,000 as well. So uh, I think prior to the budget, there was some discussion or some thought that it might be going up to 100,000. So... Uh, I think that was the only surprise there, really, wasn't it? Was that we've yeah we've, we've only got a very tiny rise, really. Well, well, I think you know there, there's a lot of small tweaks. I think it, there was an awful lot was communicated in advance of what was going to happen, but then the actual specific detail is slightly different. But yeah, um, a lot of commentary before and uh, the budget was suggesting maybe a higher increase would have more of a, a beneficial effect. But um, obviously, I think they they erred on the side of caution here. and Didn't want to do anything that might distort um, the effect in too great um, in, to too great an extent. 
and that change will come in from uh, the 1st of April this year. And we've got another small VAT wiggle, haven't we? A sort of a, a, the um, dealing with something that they've got wrong before, basically. Yeah, so so they're trying to, um, and this is part of the overall reform of some of the penalty provisions. They're trying to align how penalties work in a consistent way with a point system to actually enforce these penalties. But specifically on the VAT point, um, uh, the amount or the, the times when interest would accrue either to the benefit of Treasury or to the benefit of the, the taxpayer for an overpayment or an underpayment um, was different and also different depending on, on the circumstances. So they've, they've done a little bit of a cleanup around that, um, which should uh, simplify matters. So it's now it's when the amount is not paid by the due date, late payment or interest would be charged to the taxpayer uh, from the date the payment was due uh, until the date the payment is received. So in effect, doing it the same way that um, um, self-assessment income tax um, interest would accrue. And then HMRC will repay interest um, on any overpaid tax or tax refunds, um, uh, which are due to be repaid in that same manner. Fantastic. So do we think that really is a simplification? It, it sounds like it might be. I, I think it's definitely going in the right direction. Um, you know, like everything else, when when we see the final provisions and then any um <laughs> any say reserve judgment till we've seen the draft legislation. Well, that's it. And until we've had a chance to go through it, it's hard to sort of uh, have a, have a firm view on these things. But uh, no doubt there'll be transition provisions, which will um, let's say maybe complicate matters in the short term. But then eventually, then hopefully, we'll get to a simpler situation. <laughs> And so then we've we've also we've had some fairly minor changes to the energy profits levy. Is that right, Philip? Uh, yes, that's just going to be extended for another year uh, until April twenty twenty nine. Uh, quite a controversial controversial one within the um, Conservative Party already. The uh, leader of the Scottish Conservatives says he's going to oppose that for what that might be worth. Um, but uh, yeah, obviously uh, more of a. Uh, money raising exercise that I suppose will um that the Chancellor hopes no one will really notice very much although that uh, that won't happen when there's obviously a division there between the uh, Scottish Conservatives and the rest of the um UK party and, and I think they're going to bring forward aren't they the drafting of the provisions whereby the levy sort of falls out if um oil and gas prices come down quicker than we're anticipating um yes I think that's I think that's right that. yes yeah okay and so, so this is something that wasn't announced in the budget, but if you if you go online and have a look at all the documents, you get things which are being done alongside the budget, but weren't announced in the budget. And I think this was one of them. And this was um, the government had run, or HMRC, whoever had run a consultation on the avoidance and evasion of business rates, and that that closed and their sort of response is now out, and that came out with the budget documents. Yeah, and, and I think um, I think it's the the empty property relief. So the reset period between when the property is empty and then, let's say, occupy it again for a short time and then, uh, you know, reset where you could then re reclaim empty property relief again. And um, they've adjusted that timing, so that threshold, um, extending it from six weeks to 13 weeks. Um, which I think the, the incentive is that will discourage people from using this as a, as a way to avoid um, avoid uh, business rates. And then also, I think the, the, intent, the government intend to consult further on a specific GAR um, for business rates in England. Interesting. Another GAR. Just what we need. <laughs> you'd, yes, you'd, you'd say we've already got one, but perhaps it isn't. It isn't suitable for rates. Um, I can see how it might not be. Uh, yeah, curiously, this one, this one is um, this was being put forward as a general anti-avoidance rule rather than a general anti-abuse rule. So um, uh, it might be interesting to see if there's any yeah. any um, uh, lower lower or higher standard. Um, uh, a different sort of threshold for the behaviour. Yeah. So, for example, in in, um, in the Scottish uh, tax world, uh, there isn't a general anti-abuse rule, but a general anti-avoidance rule, which is at least thought to have a lower threshold before it kicks in uh, to the rule in Finance Act 2013. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, this new 
GA uh, avoidance R um, as a lower <laughs> threshold than the general GA abuse uh, I mean, uh, R uh, so that, we, when, that we know already. When, when, a, when the FA 2013 GAR was introduced, it was sort of sold on the basis that it wasn't just avoidance, it was the very worst avoidance, it was the abusive avoidance. So it, there's some sense perhaps yeah. the idea that it's a lower threshold if it is just avoidance. Um, so yes, and, uh, and, now, and my apologies for using the the gar uh, <laughs> for misquoting. Well, I think you didn't. You no, didn't no, it's, it's described the gar in the way. You the... just yeah. Um, so seamlessly, we're going to move from business rates onto property taxes. Do you see what we did there? Uh, so um, a couple of int well. I actually thought property taxes were leaving aside the non-dom stuff. One of the most interesting things that was that, that came out of today, um, and we've got three headline points. We've got the abolition of multiple dwellings relief for SDLT. We've got the reduction in CGT rate, and we've got the abolition of the furnished holiday let regime, um, which is, I think, yeah, one of those one of those fascinating niche areas i was saying to somebody yesterday uh, we we're talking about um a some sort of relief on a caravan park and i said oh that's very interesting actually isn't it and you're like that's peak tax barrister <laughs> tax relief on caravan parks is exciting so starting with the abolition of the um, multiple dwellings relief shane yeah so they announced that the let's say the, the rationale for having the multiple dwellings relief and when they've looked at it, it hasn't quite achieved the policy objectives that they had hoped for. Um, so the intention then is to abolish uh, the MDR uh, multi multi dwellings relief. Um, so I suppose, yeah. Do do we know anything about um, whether or not there's going to be mm. any transition, or is it just a a full stop at the end of a sentence? I haven't looked in great detail on that particular point. Um, I mean, I suppose abolitions do tend, to, I can't see why there would need to be one, abolitions do tend to be fairly final, don't they? <laughs> yeah, and, and you, you know, they would tend to be quite prompt as well, because otherwise you would have maybe potentially a flurry of activity For before or after. Um, so, you know, certainty could distort the, the property market, um, or sorry, if lack of certainty um, yeah, could distort and have uh, knock-on consequences, which... Um, Heaven forfend that we should distort the UK property market. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, the, the next one, I suppose, the reduction in, in capital gains tax. Um, so just what we need, another uh, another capital gains tax rate. So uh, this um, reduces the higher rate of capital gains tax for residential property disposals uh, from 28 to 24%. Um, the 18% remains untouched. And as far as I could see, um, um, uh, the other other areas where there's the uh, the twenty eight percent remain um, in existence. Yeah, it's it's quite a it, it's quite a small carve out of where that reduced rate applies, isn't it, or will apply? Yeah, which brings us seamlessly to furnished holiday lettings. Yes, <clears throat> and so. Um, here, the government is proposing to uh, abolish the benefit or some of the beneficial treatment that is given to furnished holiday lettings. Uh, apart from beneficial treatment, of course, um, they would be um, basically an investment business and the income would be uh, property income, not um, employment or self employment income. Um, and uh, the, the beneficial treatment means that they uh, get uh, uh, certain capital gains release. Um, that, that they wouldn't otherwise get. Uh, they get capital allowances on things like furniture, that sort of stuff. Um, uh, and the income from them uh, counts uh, to, or is available uh, for relief by means of pension contributions. Uh, the proposal is that uh, the beneficial treatment will end. So for example, all those three aspects I've just mentioned uh, will no longer apply. Uh, not much difference, for example, for an uh, inheritance tax. Uh, furnished holiday lettings have always been investment um, uh, uh, investment business, and so don't get business property relief. Lots of case law on that. Uh, Cox's executors recently, for example, in the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, the capital gains tax uh, release um, and pension contributions relief 
uh, will apparently it seems to be going. Uh, yes, which doesn't seem totally unreasonable. Uh, not, not, not that it no, is asked no, to question no. why, and, but yes, if one were to. Yes, and it, it was much more difficult to get anyway. The, the increased the number of uh, the minimum number of days you had to have the um, property let out um, maybe about six, seven years ago. So that, in fact, in Scotland, it was quite different, difficult to get relief anymore because of slightly shorter uh, holiday season uh, in Scotland um, <laughs> because of the weather, possibly, who knows? Um, but yes, it's, uh, it, it's uh, certainly uh, uh, on its very last legs uh, now. Um, I think, Karen, that was all we had on um, property taxes and now on to corporate tax. I think um, that was in your plan. Um, it, it was, yes, my, my yes, the master plan. And I think we were first going to talk briefly about full expensing for leased assets. Yes. Um, so uh, here um, in the autumn statement uh, last year, um, uh, full expensing uh, and 50% first year allowance for special rate assets was made uh, permanent, um, but plant machinery uh, for leasing is excluded from those uh, allowances. Um, uh, and what's going to happen is there's going to be a consultation, at least a consultation on extending uh, full expensing to leased assets. So not necessarily going to occur, but at least there's a consultation, um, which uh, I suppose the, the end effect is to remove what might be a distortion between the tax treatment of owned assets against leased assets, um, which is something that I think is a theme throughout legislation uh, generally. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, that's uh, that's uh, in uh, in the mix in the mix for for future future legislative legislative change. So this could, this could be at the forefront of a of a general legislative change, possibly, but nothing nothing absolutely planned yet. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, and so. Uh, two of the sort of more uh, publicly announced changes for court in relation to corporate taxes were uh, for the arts. We've got a UK film tax credit and then a specific tax release for things like theatres and orchestras, which I'm going to leave to Ben in a minute. But I was going to talk briefly about the UK film tax credit. We do have a little more detail on that. So... The reason that it is said that that we need this is that the government recognises the challenges faced by the independent film sector, the societal and cultural importance of UK independent film, independent film's role in incubating talent and the value of filmmaking investment across the UK. So what this is, is essentially it's an enhancement of an already existing tax credit, which is, I think, generally referred to as AAVEC. Um, and to be eligible for this enhancement to AVEC, you will need to have a production budget of up to 15 million. You'll have to meet what's being referred to as the new British Film Institute test. Now, it's not clear exactly what that's going to be yet, but it is likely to involve meeting at least one of the conditions of having a UK writer, a UK director, or be certified as an official UK co-production. Um, it, oh, the budget that's going to be 15 million excluding marketing and distribution budgets so that's literally just I think for production by the sounds of it um, so it's only going to apply um, for productions that started principal photography on or after the 1st of April 2024 and only expenditure after that date will be claimable as well um, so you're going to have to meet the conditions uh, for AVEC, but then to get the uh, enhanced tax credit, you're going to need to have um, things like being certified as culturally British, made by the UK, a UK production company, at least 10% of a production's core expenditure must be used or consumed in the UK. Um, you can't be a TV programme, you've got to have a theatrical release. So it's, it's things like that. Um, it's going to be it's going to be calculated on core expenditure on production activities. You can't use it against marketing or distribution, which ties in with that fifteen million limit being exclu exclusionary of marketing and distribution. 
Um, and you can claim the new credit on up to 80% of core expenditure on a film or on the amount of the UK core expenditure, if that's less. So it, it looks like it looks like it could be a fairly significant um, advantage. I think one of the things that sort of was going through my mind when I was listening to this being announced was obviously they have in the past with sort of um, these types of incentive been some quite sturdy avoidance going on. Um, so we had all the film schemes and obviously that was a different, um, that was probably more easily exploitable, but I've recently been involved in a series of cases about EIS relief in um, in relation to animation. Uh, so it, the little bit, I do wonder if it's giving with one hand and then taking away with the other, but we'll have to wait and see on that, I suppose. And it, it, while while very different to the tax relief for the for theatres and orchestras, it does sort of go hand in hand with those, doesn't it, Ben? Yes, yeah. Um, so uh, the other big news on the creative arts front is that Jeremy Hunt has extended uh, the tax relief for theatres. It was forty five percent until March twenty twenty five, and he has extended it, increased that to fifty percent, and made it permanent. Uh, so, you know, this is another play by the the treasurer to to get votes, I guess. He's, um, you know, he, uh, th this is the budget that is, um, you know, that is uh, deliberately has an eye on the next election. Um, you know, it's it's broadly good news. I mean, I don't know how many people will vote on that issue, but it, it is something that will be broadly welcomed by, you know, by the British public, um, you know, particularly theatre goers. Uh, I... And he has also introduced a 40% uh, business tax relief for for so, some film studios as well. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. They, they, Jeremy Hunt has put something for the creative arts industry in the spring budget. And so, I mean, I think one of the things that he said when he was announcing it, particularly with the the theatres and the orchestras, etc., um, was that it it drives tourism. And I do one, and and then again in relation to the film changes, that I think the number of film studios had increased hugely uh, in the last X many years. I don't remember the exact figures that he mentioned. Um, do you think it will drive investment in those sectors? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I. Um, you know, as you as you mentioned, there has been a tremendous increase in uh, investment in film studios over the last few years um, in the UK, and uh, you know, um, the, the, the uh, Jeremy Hunt would have costed this, and you know, he would be, you know, he he would, uh, you know, he 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 would have introduced the this tax relief on the basis that it would increase investment. That would be good for the economy. And, um, you know, that is the other reason why he, he introduced this relief. Okay, and I think that brings us to really what I think was the headline of this budget, which was personal taxes. And this is this is where all the really juicy stuff's happened, I think. I don't know. Definitely, definitely. Good to hear some agreement. So, Shane, could you kick us off with telling us about national insurance contributions? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, the glamorous world of uh, national insurance. So two reductions which um, will will benefit um, a lot of people. So um, first off, the, um, the main rate of uh, primary class one national insurance is reduced by 2%, bringing it down to 8%. Um, uh, from um, the start of uh, 6th of April this year. And then for self-employed people, um, they have reduced the national insurance, uh, uh, class four national insurance uh, by a further two percentage points, um, which is bringing it down to six. So they had previously announced a 1% uh, decrease, but now with this, we'll also bring it down to 6% um, effective the, uh, um, the 6th of April um, of this year. Um, yeah, so that's um, the national insurance sort of the headline. I think that would be a vote winner. At least people should feel that in their pockets. Um, whether it's sufficient or not uh, <laughs> remains to be seen, and I won't comment. Uh, I haven't. Uh -huh, yeah, but, I will, <laughs> but I will not comment. 
don't alienate people on the uh, um, yeah future voters. Um, do you, do you... We, we are mere tax barristers. We don't. That's we, it. we can't That's comment it. on politics. <laughs> exactly. Um, unless somebody else wants to say something about the national insurance, I'll, I'll move on to the uh, the high income child benefit charge change. Uh, yes, which actually, while of, I actually think this is a really important one, just because it's sort of writing something that was desperately unfair, as, or trying to anyway, <laughs> if they don't fluff it. Yes, yeah. So I think the um the high income uh, child benefit charge. So they're increasing the threshold. So increasing it from uh, fifty thousand a year to to sixty thousand. It's quite um. It's one of these that when you go over, get into that sort of into that higher um higher rate or into that uh, the, the um if you're subject then to this high income child benefit charge, it is quite um punitive the way it actually ratchets up very quickly and it would it brings your um your effective tax rate um up to a ridiculously high amount depending on the amount of children you have et cetera et cetera well, and I the think, other bit that was i think it tops out at something like 71 percent, doesn't it between yeah. um <laughs> between two income points exactly yeah so so very um quite um quite quite penal i suppose in its nature um the other thing about it was let's imagine there's a, a, a two two income family both of them on 49,000, then they get the full benefit of, of child benefit without sort of coming into this threshold. But then if there is one person who's earning, say, in, in a single income household, earning 51,000, then they would be in this sort of threshold and uh, would suffer this tax um, uh, unnecessarily yeah, so they, they, or at least yeah. this clawback. Yeah. So, so it's quite unfair on that. So there were two things that were discussed, I think, in the budget uh, today. One, they said that they want to actually look at correcting that with the two families are looking at actually household income. Um, but that's not something that's going to happen straight away. I think they intend to consult on that um, and see how that can be done. Um, but the thing that they did announce today was actually to increase the threshold by a further uh, 10,000 pounds. So bringing the threshold to 60,000 before you actually start um, yeah, that, that's sort of an interim measure almost, isn't it, to sort of address some of the unfairness on those who Correct. it's going to be uh, most effective against. Now, well, again, one of the things that I noticed when uh, Jeremy Hunt announced this was that he said HMRC, one of the reasons for the delay of sort of the broader fix is that HMRC are going to have to collect household information. And I thought this was really interesting because, as you all know, and anyone who knows me knows, um, I'm a Jersey advocate. And Jersey and Guernsey have just in the last few years moved away from the very old fashioned system where if you were married, your your husband declared your income for you. Um, so they've literally just moved away from this sort of declaration of a household income and um well, we're obviously not going all the way back. We seem to be going slightly in the other direction. Yeah, they're trying to correct an anomaly and then maybe they haven't quite figured out what they intend to do to correct it. I mean, it, it's difficult to see how one does correct it without collecting that that data, but it is it, it has ever so slightly amused me that the Channel Islands have just caught up and now, now we're going back the other way. <laughs> so, yes. Um, and so another another sort of another <clears throat> reasonably fundamental change, which I think quite nicely joins up the um, the investment sort of nature of the budget with personal taxes, is this new ISA, Ben? Yeah. Um, so Jeremy Hunt has announced a consultation for a new ISA of five thousand pounds. So this is an addition to the uh, original or the, the current ISA limit of £20,000. Um, again, I'd see this measure as being focused on trying to win a few votes and probably good for the economy as well. It, uh, it's encouraging saving, encouraging investment. So, uh, um, you know, Jeremy Hunt is focused on those two two goals and um, yeah. I'm well, sure it will be more than a single £5,000 product. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's oh you know it, it is what it is. It's a it, it's it's a it's a small amount, but um you know it's 
um, you know, I, I it will be broadly popular um, with the with the British public. So um, yeah, I um, you know I um, yeah I you know I think um, yeah it'll be interesting to see what comes out of the consultation. And so the next one, this is sort of quite a niche one. Um, the announce, announcement of changes to amendment of gift aid legislation for the digital market. Yes, <clears throat> well, actually, it's, it's it's not so much the digital market. It's um, to do with the uh, new um, bill on digital markets, competition and consumer law, um, which okay. is going to introduce stronger protections for consumers who take out subscription contracts. So the sort of contract where uh, you pay, pay ten pounds a month uh, unless and until you cancel it at some point. Apparently, there are lots of these contracts that people just never cancel, uh, even though they really should. Um, it creates apparently a problem for uh, charities. Uh, the the particular protections that are, that are going to be put in place for lots of charities have subscription uh, arrangements. So I uh, pay ten pounds a month to the World Wildlife Fund or uh, or the um, Woodland Trust or whatever it might be, or you might have a friends of um, a theatre or something like that. Um, and the protections at, uh, in the new bill are going to make it complicated for charities to retain gift relief, gift aid relief, where um, uh, certain uh, rights are exercised by consumers to cancel the subscriptions. Um, so uh, the government's realised that and is going to legislate to uh, protect uh, charities from um, potential problems to gift aid relief that might be caused uh, by the additional protections in the new uh, uh, digital rights uh, competition consumer bill. Um, details inevitably uh, to be announced. Uh, yes, I, I suppose one of the best things about doing a budget episode is at least you usually don't have to read all of the legislation because there isn't any, or at least there isn't much. Yes, yes, uh, I suppose you should point out we are doing this on budget day. Um, so but, yeah, uh, this is, look, if you, if you, you can is, see uh, out, very much out, first. out of Philip's yeah. window that it is pitch black out there, that is because it is budget night. <laughs> so we are yes. cutting edge here. <laughs> anyway. Might be not cutting edge, let's see. <laughs> so that Moving brings, on. That brings us to what I think um, was one of the most anticipated, uh, but also one of the most fundamental changes that we were going to see arising out of this budget and that is the change to the rules about non-UK domiciliaries. Um, so very briefly a non-domiciliary is effectively somebody who does not belong in a particular place, they belong somewhere else so they might be resident somewhere and the UK has had a has had, has a, has had a regime for a very long time I think we were one of the first countries to have a regime for non-domiciliaries. Um, and it started not very long after we started up with income tax full stop. Um, so it's been around for a very long time, this regime where if you effectively don't belong in the UK, you don't pay tax on the same basis as those who do belong here. Um, the biggest benefit of that has been that if you are a non-dom, um, and after you've been here for a certain amount of time, you're a non-dom who pays a, a charge and claims the relief, you will be taxed on the remittance basis. And that means that you, um, even though you live in the UK, you only pay tax on your UK income or things that you remit from abroad to the UK. So that's going. So if you haven't learned about that, don't bother, it's too late. Um, you've only got a year left of it. From 6th of April next year, that's going, and this is going to be replaced by a, a period of four years in which foreign income and gains, uh, being referred to as FIG, which I quite like, there's going to be a FIG regime for individuals who become UK tax resident after a period of 10 tax years of non-UK residents. And if you qualify for that, in that, in that four-year period, um, FIG that arises in those first four years um, is, is free from any charge, and that includes if you remit it, um, and you won't pay tax on non-resident trust distributions. You still pay tax on UK income and gains, uh, which is very, 
I'd say. <laughs> if so, um, there are all sorts of questions about this. Um, some have been answered. There's a technical note that has already been published. Um, so you can look at sort of some more of the detail in there. But essentially, that is the overall structure. Some of the questions that are being answered are, first of all, if on the 6th of April 2025, you've been tax resident in the UK for less than four years, after 10 years of non-UK tax resident, um, you can have the remaining years. So if you'd been out for 12 years, in for two years, as of 6th of April 2025, you can have your two years in that of, of FIG, effectively. Um, the overseas workday relief for the first um, three tax years of UK residents is going to be retained but simplified. Um, but your eligibility for it is going to be based on uh, residents and whether or not you opt into the new FIG regime. So it really doesn't seem like that long ago, and I really don't think it was that long ago. We all had to grapple with the um, new protected uh, trusts regime. Uh, that's going. That will be removed from the 6th of April 2025 for all current non-domiciled and deemed domiciled individuals who don't qualify for the new four-year FIG regime. A FIG that arises in non-resident trust structures from the 6th of April 2025 is going to be taxed on the settler or the transferor if they became UK resident for more than four tax years um, on the arising basis. So that's going to be the same um, as currently for UK domiciled settlers. Um, transitional. If you have FIG which arose in that structure before the 6th of April 2025, that's going to be taxed on settlers or beneficiaries if they are matched to worldwide trust distributions. Um, there's a reasonably beneficial transitional regime. So if you're on the remittance basis now and you're going to move to the arising basis on the 6th of April 2025 because you're not eligible for the new four-year FIG regime, um, in 25-26, you can pay tax on 50% of your foreign income. Um, that's only income, it's not chargeable gains. And then from 26-27 onwards, it's everything. But you've got a year, you've got a year sort of a, a, a half, a year, year at half on income, but gains are the same. Though, of course, that, that gives rise to a planning point. Um, Pre 6th of April 2025 FIG, there's going to be a temporary uh, re repatriation facility um, in 2526 and 2627. And that means that you can elect to pay tax at a reduced rate of 12% on those pre April 25 remittances um, in 2526 and 2627. So I think. I think, and I'm looking at everybody on screen, those are the um, key key takeaway points. Oh, capital gains tax rebasing. Um, mm, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so um, from 6th of April 2025, if you're not or you cease to be eligible for the FIG regime, you've got, you're going to be taxed on gains in the normal way. However, if you've claimed the remittance basis um, mm -hmm. and are neither UK domiciled nor deemed domiciled by 5th of April 2025, then um, when you dispose of a personally held foreign asset that was held at the 5th of April 2019, you can rebase that asset to its 2019 value, essentially. Um, ominously, the technical note says this rebasing will be subject to conditions that will be set out later. So we can look forward to those. Mm -hmm. Inheritance tax, obviously inheritance tax is one of the key areas where we rely on domicile. That's going to go. Um, that's going to go to a residence-based system. That's still subject to consultation, but will apply from the 6th of April, 2025. As I understand it, and I'm not sure that it's, um, as I understand it, Essentially, now, how was this described to me? I'm just going to look at this. Um, sorry, bear with me. Um, effectively, I think if you've got an existing, no, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to read it. Sorry, bear with me a second. 
<laughs> so you can continue to settle excluded property until the 6th of April 2025 and the current regime will apply. So that's obviously yeah. an important planning point. Um, <clears throat> however, I think there seems to be the view that effectively there's going to be a, a shorter sort of residence period with a tail on either side of it. Um, so yes, uh, a 10 a ten year period before um, UK domiciliary tax treatment kicks in, um, but a 10 year tail for leavers. So if you leave, you're going to be st stuck with the with with being effectively having the UK based mm -hmm. treatment for the next 10 years, but none of that's decided. And I'm seeing that more in, um, uh, yeah, that's that's subject to consultation. So mm -hmm. the inheritance tax position is changing broadly in line with the income tax and capital gains tax position, but we don't, we don't know quite yet um, what that's going to uh, result in, in its entirety. Um, there is going to be a consultation that hasn't been released. It doesn't, we don't get any indication of when it will be released. What I will say is now is the time to plan, plan, plan for remittance basis users, um, those who have previously or might previously have been able to benefit from uh, remittance basis treatment, those whose IHT planning is reliant on being remittance basis users and those who have protected trusts as well. All of those are just incredibly important things to be looking at doing now obviously without having the fine granular detail that's difficult to do but what we can all be doing is getting our our lay clients um ready and understanding that they're going to need to do something and all the solicitors who spent the entire afternoon answering the phone are sitting there with their head in their hands going they know they know but they need yes. to get on with it <laughs> yeah, i should mention at this point that um obviously one of the one of the foremost practitioners and uh, the UK in this area, James Kessler, KC in the Old Square Tax Chambers, will be giving uh, a, a seminar at some point in the next uh, few weeks on, on planning ideas uh, in the face of this um, change to uh, the um, uh, legislation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we'll uh, keep, keep our eyes open for that. Um, next point in personal taxes, uh, Harriet's am amendments to the transfer of assets abroad regime. Um, uh, this, of course, follows the uh, Supreme Court case of Fisher uh, last year, I think. Um, uh, transfer yeah, assets abroad. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Rory Mullen, KC, also of Old Square Tax Chambers, was was one of the advocates in in that Supreme Court case. Uh, yes, he won that uh, actually, and uh, uh, of the three Supreme Court cases uh, that our chambers did last year, his was the only win. Mine were two losses, but uh, <laughs> there you have it. Um, uh, so yeah, transfer assets, uh, transfer assets abroad, roughly. Uh, if someone in the UK transfers assets to someone uh, abroad, uh, the, the UK person uh, is still deemed to receive the income from those assets for UK tax purposes. Um, uh, Fisher, I think, uh, broadly said that if the transfer is made not by um, an individual, but by a company, uh, it, uh, it doesn't uh, engage this regime. It's not, uh, yeah, the, the transfer is not imputed back to the individual so to speak yeah yes so so i think this change is just uh really to reverse that decision so uh so that where the transfer is made by a close company um a participator in the company who who would have uh, engaged this regime if the transfer had been made by that participator that individual participator um uh, that individual participator will still be within this uh, regime uh, notwithstanding the transfer was made by the company and not uh, him or her. Um, so so. Taxpayer finally gets a win in the Supreme Court and legislation mere months later erases it. <laughs> there you have it. Uh, yes, have it. so not, 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 of, not of hugely broad impact, but very interesting because of the history to it with it sort of Hmm. effectively using legislation to reverse a Supreme Court decision, which, of course, they're more than entitled to do. And in this case, I can absolutely see why they would want to do it, because it's the, the, there are very obvious sort of planning mechanisms and quite artificial ones based from based on the back of that Supreme Court decision. Um, but the other interesting thing about it is it's sort of been 
sniggled in a little bit, hasn't it? That's sort of it wasn't it wasn't front and center anywhere, and it's not even particularly visible in the budget document itself. But it is there, and we have got it. Um, not necessarily a vote winner, then. Oh, possibly not, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> probably not a vote loser either i mean it says let's make tax avoidance measures stronger probably not a vote loser but yes not not front and center by any means <laughs> and so i think, uh, I think that those are the, the administration matters now um right, we've covered all the main taxes and uh i think you've got something to say about a couple of things there i i have and this is really this isn't very big news and we've known about it for a long time because it comes out of the OECD. Um, what is interesting about it is that I think it gives us a little bit of a uh, affirming up of the date. Essentially, we have this regime called CRS, the Common Reporting Standard, which was designed and introduced by the OECD. Lots of countries sign up to it and it's it allows revenue authorities to exchange basic information, names, addresses, and um, account details and account balances about ultimate beneficial owners, very broadly speaking. Um, last year, it, it, it was decided that, or possibly even before that, this needed sort of tightening up a bit, some changes need to be made, and they're do this was going to be done alongside the introduction of something called the Crypto Asset Reporting Framework, now, the crypto asset reporting framework essentially is essentially a version of CRS that says um, crypto exchanges. You may think that you're not a financial institution, but now you are. If you weren't before, you are now. So effectively, it gives a similar sort of set of obligations to institutions like crypto exchanges. Um, and so there are sort of there are a number of points. There's a consultation ongoing. Um, and essentially, we're going. It's going to introduce the CAF, and that's going to be brought into UK legislation. Though it will function in the same way with sort of this multilateral spider's web of mutual relationships. Um, and then we've just got a couple of amendments to CRS. What we've been told today is that. Um, we are going to be seeing the CRS dealt with in regulations, and I think we're going to see that increasingly common, commonly that this is going to be dealt with. These sorts of changes are going to be dealt with by um, uh, by regulation and not by primary legislation. But perhaps the more interesting thing is that in the consultation, HMRC are seeking views on domestic reporting. So we are sort of getting this idea that we 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 the domestic reporting is going to become sort of contiguous with international reporting so that's got a little way to develop yet um but it's interesting to see that that oecd driven project is being brought into being with the um with the international well, sorry with the domestic provisions that the finance the bill and the budget consider so that was one point for tax administration. And Philip, once again, they are trying to raise our standards, aren't they? Yeah, it's obviously not necessary in relation to old square tax chambers, but apparently it turns out that others aren't quite up to uh, our standards. <laughs> uh, no, I suppose part of HMRC's uh, ongoing um, uh, uh, attempts to uh, basically stop tax advisors um, uh, advising on artificial avoidance schemes, I think, uh, two things are being proposed um first uh, uh, uh changes to the system by which tax advisors register with hmrc hmrc are going to take a more proactive approach they're going to check in particular two things first is registration uh, for any anti money laundering supervision uh requirements uh that's um perhaps not too great to change second point is that they're going to check that tax agents are up to date with their own tax affairs um, which is uh, quite, a, quite a big uh, change, I think, at least in terms of approach. Uh, and these things are going to be subject to uh, ongoing checks from time to time. And that's point number one. Point number two uh, is uh, what's described as simply further action to raise standards in the tax advice market. Um, uh, they are uh, thinking about uh, three different uh, strategies. Number one, 
uh, requiring um, tax advisors to be members of professional bodies. That's not the case uh, at the moment. Tax advisors needn't be a member of any professional body to give tax advice. Um, number two, um, uh, HMRC and industry jointly monitoring um, uh, standards uh, in the tax advice uh, market. Um, uh, not terribly clear how that would uh, work. Uh, number three, regulation by a new government body uh, that would set, monitor, enforce, and raise standards uh, in the market. How that would uh, uh, coordinate with existing professional bodies is uh, not yet clear. Seems to me a fairly expensive uh, way to uh, deal with matters. So um, my bet would be on number one, mandatory membership of professional body, but um, we'll see after uh, uh, another consultation that's uh, due to begin. But yes, I think so. That, that's been a bit of a romp through the uh, budgets from today. And I'm sure we have missed some interesting points. But as we've said, we will be um, certainly coming back with something on the non-DOM changes in recent weeks, in recent weeks, in coming weeks, recent weeks, in coming weeks. And um, yes, there's something for everyone, fans of administration, fans of corporate taxes, even fans of business rates. <laughs> <laughs> so uh philip over to you to say goodbye to everybody well thanks very much everyone for um watching uh this special budget edition of uh tax next uh thanks to our contributors for uh getting up to speed so quickly with uh, a whole raft of uh changes uh, and we hope uh, that uh, you uh, enjoyed uh watching and uh and you found it interesting uh, see you next time bye Bye. Bye.